Hello and welcome to Ask FSU, where I ask professors or experts some ridiculous questions and the points don't matter. Well, the talking points matter a lot. I'm your host, Philip Schlenoff, here in the Geoset studio at Florida State University. Today's episode will focus on physics and astronomy. My first guest is Dr. Jeff Owens, Gunter Schwartz Professor and Distinguished Research Professor in the Physics Department at Florida State University. Thank you for joining me, Professor Owens. You're welcome. He's going to shed some light on some light-related questions. The first question I have is why can't anything travel faster than the speed of light? What makes 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second the ultimate limit of speed in the universe? This goes back to a paper written by Albert Einstein in 1905. And he had a very simple idea that he put forward, and that is that the laws of physics should be the same in all reference frames that are moving at constant speeds with respect to each other. Why is that a good thing? Well, we want the laws of physics, which would include the, the laws of uh, electricity and magnetism, to be the same, because we wouldn't want, for example, uh, electric forces that hold things together to simply change or fall apart if we went too fast. So from, from a very practical uh, and pragmatic standpoint, we want the laws of physics to be the same in all reference frames that move at constant speeds with respect to each other. In the mid-1860s, a physicist named uh, Maxwell wrote down a set of equations which very accurately described the, the laws of electricity and magnetism as mm -hmm. they were then known. Mm -hmm. And one of the predictions that came out of this was that there should be a form of radiation that could propagate through space and people realized very quickly that this radiation had all the properties of light. So okay. you could say that light as electromagnetic radiation was predicted by Maxwell's equations. Oh. So by the turn of the century, that is the early 1900s, uh, people recognized that Maxwell's equations described electricity and magnetism extremely well. Mm -hmm. If you combine that with Einstein's proposal that the laws of physics would be the same in, in all what are called inertial coordinate systems, okay. one frame moving at a constant speed with respect to another, mm -hmm. then you, ha you come into the, the interesting idea that since the speed of light, c, in vacuum, right. um, is a, it comes out actually from Maxwell's equations, mm -hmm. well then these equations should hold in all the different frames. So that means that if you were to change your coordinates from one type of system to another moving coordinate system, going from somebody standing on a sidewalk to watching a car move by, you move mm -hmm. to the frame of the car, well then the laws of electromagnetism have to stay the same. That means the equations have to be invariant under some kind of coordinate transformation. Mm -hmm. And that was known as a Lorentz transformation. And the interesting thing about the Lorentz transformation is that by design, the speed of light will be the same in all these different coordinate systems. Mm -hmm. And that, that runs afoul of common sense everyday experience because right. for example if you could throw a soft a hard ball at 90 miles an hour and then you got into a car that was doing 60 miles an hour mm -hmm. and you threw it you'd expect the ball to then be going at 150 miles an hour and, yeah, and that's that that seems like simple addition of velocities but in fact under a Lorentz transformation as you get close to the speed of light it doesn't work quite that way mm -hmm. So then you go back and ask well how does that affect the the laws of mechanics Newton's laws F equals MA we're used to thinking that if you could accelerate an object indefinitely, it could go arbitrarily fast. Mm -hmm. And so you'd think, well, it's you, used to. <laughs> you could accelerate it past the speed of light. But what happens is, as you get closer to going at the speed of light, it gets harder and harder to accelerate the object. You can put more energy in, it can mm -hmm. become a more energetic particle, but it won't be going very mm -hmm. much faster. So to give a very concrete example, if you look at the Large Hadron Collider in right. Geneva, Switzerland, uh, in the last running period, they accelerated protons to 8,000 trillion electron volts of energy. That's a lot. That's 8, 000, yeah. roughly 8,000 times the mass of the proton itself. Mm -hmm. If you work out carefully what's going on, the speed that the proton was traveling at will be 0.9999999922 mm -hmm. times the speed of light. 
They accelerated it. it. <laughs> so the energy was higher and higher and higher, mm -hmm. but it just didn't go past the speed of light. Now, that comes out of the Lorentz transformations. It comes out of Einstein's postulate, and it works. It describes very accurately how these particles behave as they get uh, to a speed closer than the speed of light. Now, okay. what would happen if you actually could travel at the speed of light? Mm -hmm. Well, then you could ask yourself, what would light actually look like? Because yeah. you're traveling as fast as the light travels. Mm -hmm. And you'd think, well, then light would be standing still if you used... Right. Wouldn't warm... that just be running next to a beam of light? <laughs> That's what you might think based on everyday experience. But uh -huh. in fact, remember that under the Lorentz transformation, the speed of light is always the same in any coordinates. The speed system. of light is always the speed of light, right? And, yeah. So, so in fact, even though you were going faster and faster, uh, the light would still be traveling uh, at speed C as seen by you. Yeah. <laughs> so if I was running at the speed of light, turned on a flashlight, that light would go the speed of light. Yeah. And that, that little uh, mm -hmm. uh, example shows you exactly why you can't go at the speed of light. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. Not to say that things can't, uh, as I understand, tachyons is a conceptual particle that, that yes. perhaps Ta could tach travel. Tachyons, or superluminal particles as they're called, are particles that, that, that travel faster than the speed of light. But we haven't seen them. Well, and we probably won't, because the, the interesting thing about a tachyon is the more you try and slow it down, the faster it goes. So it can, a tachyon <laughs> can never slow down to the speed of light. Mm -hmm. and we uh, we okay. can never speed up to the speed of light. So t a tachyon world and our Beyond world our, are, our are separated by this wall provided by the speed of light. Oh, that's very interesting. Okay, so my second question is if photons have no mass, how do solar sails work? Essentially, uh, solar sails are, are big sails they put onto the side of, of spaceships or mm, are conceived of. Uh, they get hit by photons and increase their speed just because they're getting hit by light. But if a photon can't have mass, can't it, doesn't it not have momentum since momentum is mass times velocity? Momentum is mass times velocity for slowly moving particles that have mass. In fact, for mm -hmm. a photon, the correct expression for the momentum is its energy divided by the speed of light, E over C. Okay. That's true for a massless particle. And for a photon, we can relate its energy to its frequency. So if, um, E is equal to H, Planck's constant, times the frequency mm -hmm. of the light. The momentum of the photon is H times C, H times nu divided by C. So it so, just depends on the frequency. Yes, and the photon actually has momentum, and the way the solar sail works is it's made out of a reflective material. The light hits the sail and bounces back, so there's been an ex a change in its momentum. Mm -hmm. It had momentum P going in and minus P going out. So yeah. uh, that means there was momentum transferred to the sail in amount to P. Okay, so the momentum of the photon is given by its frequency is transferred to kinetic energy, essentially, in the photon. Essentially, the solar sail. It, yes. Okay. It, Okay, that's cool. And my last question uh, involves black holes. So I want to ask you, what is a black hole made of? Essentially, is it like a concrete thing? Is there a, a, a black hole that I can move somewhere and leave it go and it's a, it's a black hole? Is there a material that it's just a condensed ball of atoms or, or what exactly? Well, the simplest version of a black hole would just be a, a, a spherically symmetric mm -hmm. uh, mass concentration in a small enough region of space so that you have a, a very high density. And okay. in that case, what happens is that the space curves. Mm -hmm. the, the concentration of mass will actually cause space to be curved and it will cause particles that are moving to follow that curved space. Okay. They're basically in free fall, but they're falling in a curved path. Mm -hmm. And in a black hole, uh, the mass is inside what's called the Schwarzschild radius or the event horizon. And so something inside uh, can't exceed the speed of light. And it, in fact, even light can't ex get out uh, from this black hole. Mm -hmm. It can't go fast enough yeah. to break through because the space is curved. Right. So there's no specific um, type of mass. Any mass will do. 
Uh, so oh, okay. there's no no such thing as saying what a black hole is made out of. It's just a bunch of matter. That's it could be anything that's dense enough yes. to cause space-time to curve around well, it. And, and we have to be careful, too, to uh, if you want to get really precise. If a black hole mm -hmm. gets big enough, the average density of the black hole uh, could be something similar to just water. It's not very dense if it's mm -hmm. large enough. The, the trick is to get enough mass into a region of space that mm -hmm. uh, space itself is warped and, and, and particles then follow closed orbits inside okay. that. So when something travels past that event horizon and it's drawn into the black hole, basically just sticks to whatever center mass is causing that? We don't know what's in there. We just mm -hmm. know it goes inside. Yeah, okay. All right, that's very cool. So thank you again, Professor Owens, for joining me. And uh, th I'm going to spend a few hours on Wikipedia after this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I've enjoyed it. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, appreciate it. And I hope that answers your questions too. Thank you again for joining me for that very insightful interview from Dr. Jeff Owens. Feel free to post questions you'd like me to consider in the future in the comments section. And stay tuned for your next episode of Ask FSU.